Hey, Eric. <clears throat> Alright. Well, I think it's just you tonight. At least watching it live. So, um, I'm just going to go ahead and start. And since it's kind of late, I think I'm going to limit it to three chapters. Probably. We'll see how, how it goes. Alright. <clears throat> Chapter 36. All this knowing. Days passed, and I invited Will and Sim across the river to celebrate our successful campaign against Ambrose. Given my taste for Soontan, I was not much of a drinker, but Will and Sim were kind enough to demonstrate the fine points of the art. We visited several different taverns, just for variety, but eventually... Yes? I hear you. I see a tail. He hears me reading, and he's coming. Okay. He's so, um, reliable. We visited several different taverns, just for variety, but eventually we ended up back at the Aeolian. I preferred it because of the music, Simmon because of the women, and Willem because it served Scutton. I was moderately well-buttered when I was called up onto the stage, but it takes more than a little drink to make me fumble-fingered. Hello. <laughs> just to prove I was not drunk, I made my way through Wither with Heath with... Oh my god. Yeah, this would definitely prove... Just saying this title would prove you're not drunk. I made my way through Wither with He with the Withy, a song that's difficult enough to articulate when sober as a stone. The audience loved it, and I showed its appreciation its appreciation in the appropriate way. And, oh my god, one more time. The audience loved it and showed its appreciation in the appropriate way. And since I was not drinking Soontan that night, much of the evening is lost to living memory. The three of us walked the long road back from the Aeolian. There was a crispness to the air that spoke of winter, but the three of us were young and warmed from the inside by many drinks. A breeze pushed my cloak back and I took a full happy breath. Then a sudden panic seized me. Where's my loot? I asked more loudly than I'd intended. You left it with Stanchion at the Aeolian, Willem said. He was afraid you would trip over it and break your neck. Simmon had stopped in the middle of the road. I bumped into him, lost my balance, and tumbled to the ground. He hardly seemed to notice. Well, he said seriously, I certainly don't feel up to that right now. Stonebridge rose ahead of us, two hundred feet from end to end, with a high arch that peaked five stories above the river. It was part of the great stone road, straight as a nail, flat as a table, and older than God. I knew it weighed more than a mountain. I knew it had a three-foot parapet running along both its edges. Despite all this knowing, eh, that's the name of the chapter, I felt deeply uneasy at the thought of trying to cross it. I climbed unsteadily to my feet. As the three of us examined the bridge, Willem began to lean slowly to one side. I reached out to steady him, and at the same time, Simmon laid hold of my arm, though whether to help me or brace himself, I couldn't be certain. I certainly don't feel up to that right now, Simmon repeated. There's a place to sit over here, Willem said. Kella trel turin navorka. Simmon and I muffled our laughter, and Willem led us through the trees to a little clearing not fifty feet from the foot of the bridge. To my surprise, a tall gray stone stood at the middle of it, pointing skyward. Will entered the clearing with calm familiarity. I came m more slowly, looking about curiously. Gray stones are special to troopers, and seeing it gave rise to mixed feelings. Simmon flopped down in the thick grass while Willem settled his back against the trunk of a leaning birch. I moved to the gray stone and touched it with my fingertips. It was warm and familiar. Don't push at that thing, Simmon said nervously. You'll tip it over. I laughed. This stone has been here for a thousand years, Sim. I don't think my breathing on it is going to hurt it. Just come away from it. They're not good things. It's a gray stone, I said, giving it a friendly pat. They mark old roads. If anything, we're safer being next to it. Gray stones mark safe places. Everyone knows that. Sim shook his head stubbornly. They're pagan relics. A jot says I'm right, I taunted. Ha! Still on his back, Sim held up a hand. I stepped over to slap it, formalizing our wager. We can go to the archives and settle it tomorrow, Sim said. I sat down next to the gray stone and had just started to relax when I was seized by a sudden panic. Body of God, I said. My loot! I tried to jump to my feet and failed, almost managing to knock out my brains against the gray stone in the process. Simmon tried to sit up and calm me, but the sudden motion was too much for him and he fell awkwardly onto his side and began to laugh helplessly. This isn't funny, I shouted. It's at the Aeolian, Willem said. You've asked about, f about it four times since we left. No, I haven't, I said with more conviction than I really felt. I rubbed my head where I'd knocked, against, knocked it against the greystone. There is no reason to be ashamed, Willem waved a hand dismissively. 
It is man's nature to dwell on what sits close to his heart. I heard Kilvin got a few in him at the taps a couple months ago and wouldn't shut up about his new cold sulfur lamp, Simmons said. Will snorted. Lauren would rattle on about proper shelving behavior. behavior. Grasped by the spine. Grasped by the spine. He growled and made clutching motions with both hands. If I hear him say it again, I will grasp his spine. A flash of memory came to me. Merciful Tellu, I said, suddenly aghast. Did I sing Tinker Tanner at the Aeolian tonight? You did, Simmons said. I didn't know it had so many verses. I wrinkled my forehead, trying desperately to remember. Did I sing the verse about the Telen and the sheep? It was not a good verse for polite company. Nia, Willem said. Thank God, I said. It was a goat, Willem managed seriously before he bubbled up into laughter. In the Telen's cassock, Simmons sang, then joined Willem in laughter. No, no, I said miserably, resting my head in my hands. My mother used to make my dad sleep under a, under the wagon when he sang that in public. Stanchion will beat me with a stick and take away my pipes next time I see him. They loved it, Simon reassured me. I saw Stanchion singing along, Willem added. His nose was a little red by that time, too. There was a long piece of comfortable quiet. Kvath? Simon asked. Yes? Are you really a demon bru? The question caught me unprepared. Normally it would have set me on edge, but at the moment I didn't know how I felt about it. Does it matter? No, I was just wondering. Oh, I continued to watch the stars for a while. Wondering what? Nothing in particular, he said. Ambrose called you Rue a couple times, but he's called you other insulting things before. It's not an insult, I said. I mean, he's called you things that weren't true, Sim said quickly. You don't talk about your family, but you've said things that made me wonder. He shrugged, still flat on his back, looking up at the stars. I've never known one of the edema. Not well, anyway. What you hear isn't true, I said. We don't steal children or worship dark gods or anything like that. I never believed any of that, he said dismissively, then added, but some of the things they say must be true. I've never heard anyone play like you. That doesn't have anything to do with my, with my being a Dima Rua, I said, then reconsidered. Maybe a little. Do you dance? Willem asked, seemingly out of the blue. If the comment had come from anyone else or at a different time, it probably would have started a fight. That's just how people picture us. Playing pipes and fiddles, dancing around our campfires, when we aren't stealing everything that isn't nailed down, of course. A little bitterness crept into my tone when I said the last. That's not what being a Dima Rue is about. What is it about? Simon asked. I thought about it for a moment, but my sodden wit wasn't up to the task. We're just people, really, I said eventually, except we don't stay in one place very long and everyone hates us. The three of us watched the stars quietly. Did she really make him sleep under the wagon? Simon asked. What? You said your mom made your dad sleep under the wagon for singing the verse about the sheep. Did she really? It's mostly a figure of speech, I said, but once she really did. I didn't often think of my early life in my troop, back when my parents were alive. I avoided the subject the same way a cripple learns to keep the weight, of, weight off an injured leg. But Sim's question brought a memory bubbling to the surface of my mind. It wasn't for singing Tinker Tanner, I found myself saying. It was a song he'd written about her. I was quiet for a long moment, then I said it. Lorian. It was the first time I'd said my mother's name in years. The first time since she'd been killed. It felt strange in my mouth. Then, without really meaning to, I began to sing. Dark Lorian, Arladin's wife, has a face like the blade of a knife, has a voice like a prickled brown burr, but can tally a sum like a monkey lender. My sweet tally cannot cook, but she keeps a tidy ledger book. For all her faults, I do confess, it's worth my life to make my wife not tally a lot less. I felt oddly numb, disconnected from my own body. Strangely, while the memory was sharp, it wasn't painful. I can see how that might earn a man a place under the wagon, Willem said gravely. It wasn't that, I heard myself saying. She was beautiful, and they both knew it. They used to tease each other all the time. It was the meter. She hated the awful meter. I never talked about my parents, and referring to them in the past tense felt uncomfortable. Disloyal. Will and Sim weren't surprised by my revelation. Anyone who knew me knew... Anyone who knew me could tell I had no family. I'd never said anything, but they were good friends. They knew. In Autour, we sleep in the kennels when our wives are angry, Simmons said, nudging the conversation back into safer territory. Melosi Ruhu Eda Stiti, Willem muttered. Autourin, Simmons shouted, his voice bubbling with amusement. No more of your donkey talk. Eda Stiti, I repeated. You sleep next to fire? Willem nodded. I'm officially protesting how quickly you picked up Siaru, Sim said, holding up a finger. 
I studied a year before I was any good. A year! You gobble it up in a single term. I learned a lot growing up, I said. I was just getting the fine points this term. Your accent is better, Will said to Sim. Quoth sounds like some southern trader. Very low. You sound much more refined. Sim seemed mollified by that. Next to the fire, he repeated. Does it seem odd that it's the men that always have to do their sleeping somewhere else? It's pretty obvious women control the bed, I said. Not an unpleasant thought, Will said, depending on the woman. Distril is pretty, Sim said. Keh, Will said. Too pale. Thela. Simon shook his head mournfully. Out of our league. She is Modigan, Willem said, his grin so wide it was almost demonic. She is? Sim asked. Will nodded, wearing the widest smile I'd ever seen on his face. Sim sighed wretchedly. It figures. Bad enough that she's the prettiest girl in the Commonwealth. I didn't know she was Modigan, too. I'll grant you prettiest girl on her side of the river, I corrected. On this side, there's— You've already gone on about your denna, Will interrupted. Five times. Listen, Simmons said, his tone suddenly serious. You just have to make your move. This denna girl is obviously interested in you. She hasn't said anything along those lines. They never say they're interested, Simmons laughed at the absurdity of it. There are little games. It's like a dance. He held up two hands, making them talk to each other. Oh, fancy meeting you here. Why, hello, I was just going to lunch. What a happy coincidence. So was I. Can I carry your books? I held up a hand to stop him. Can we skip to the end of this puppet show where you end up sobbing into your beer for a span of days? Simmons scowled at me. Willem laughed. She has enough men fawning over her, I said. They come and go, like... I strained to think of an analogy and failed. I'd rather be her friend. You would rather be close to her heart, Willem said without any particular inflection. You would rather be joyfully held in the circle of her arms. But you fear she will reject you. You fear she would laugh and you would look look the fool. Willem shrugged easily. You are hardly the first to feel this way. There is no shame in it. That struck uncomfortably close to the mark, and for a long moment I couldn't think of anything to say in reply. I hope, I admitted quietly, but I don't want to assume. I've seen what happens to the men that assume too much and cling to her. Willem nodded solemnly. She bought you that loot case, Sim said helpfully. That has to mean something. But what does it mean, I said. It seems like she's interested, but what if she's just what if it's just wishful thinking on my part? All those other men must think she's interested too, but they're obviously wrong. What if I'm wrong too? You'll never know unless you try, Sim said with a bitter edge to his voice. That's what I'd normally say, but you know what? It doesn't it doesn't work worth a damn. I chase them and they kick at me like I'm a dog at the dinner table. I'm tired of trying so hard. He gave a weary sigh, still flat on his back. All I want is someone who likes me. All I want is a clear sign, I said. I want a magical horse that fits in my pocket, Will said, and a ring of red amber that gives me power over demons, and an endless supply of cake. There was another moment of comfortable quiet. The wind brushed gently through the trees. They say the Rood know all of all the stories in the world, Simmons said after a while. Probably true, I admitted. Tell one, he said. I eyed him narrowly. Don't look at me like that, he protested. I'm in the mood for a story, that's all. We are somewhat lacking for entertainment, Willem said. Fine, fine, let me think. I closed my eyes and a story with Amir and it bubbled to the surface. Hardly surprising. They had been on my mind constantly since Nina had found me. Get down. I sat up straight. All right. I took a breath, then paused. If either of you have to go piss, do it now. I don't like having to stop halfway through. Silence. Okay, I cleared my throat. There is a place not many folk have seen, a strange place called Ferianiel. I'm, I have no idea if I pronounced that right. If you believe the stories, there are two things that make Ferianiel unique. First, it is where all the roads in the world meet. Second, it is not a place any man has ever found by searching. It is not a place you travel to. It is the place you pass through while on your way to somewhere else. They say that anyone who travels long enough will come there. This is a story of that place, and of an old man on a long road, and of a long and lonely night without a moon. Chapter 37 A Piece of Fire Ferineal was a great crossroads, but there was no inn where the roads met. Instead, there were clearings in the trees where travelers would set their camps and pass the night. Hey, stop that right now, or I'll spray you with water. Um, 
Okay. Once, years ago and miles away, five groups of travelers came to Ferenil. They chose their clearings and lit their fires as the sun began to set. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking, too. A story within a story within a story. Like, literally, we're three, th three stories deep now. That happened in the last book, too. Um, they chose their clearings and lit their fires as the sun began to set, pausing on their way from here to there. Later, after the sun had set and night was settled firmly in the sky, an old beggar in a tattered robe came walking down the road. He moved with slow care, leaning on a walking stick. The old man was going from nowhere to nowhere. He had no hat for his head and no pack for his back. This is sounding like a Dr. Seuss book now. He had not a penny or a purse to put it in. He barely even owned his own name, and even that had been worn thin and threadbare through the years. If you'd asked him who he was, he would have said, Nobody, but he would have been wrong. The old man made his way into Ferenil. He was hungry as a dry fire and weary to his bones. All that kept him moving was the hope that someone might give him a bit of dinner and a piece of their fire. So when the old man saw firelight flickering, he left the road and made his weary way toward it. Soon he saw all, four tall horses through the trees. Silver was worked into their harness, and silver was mixed with the iron of their shoes. Nearby, the beggar saw a dozen mules laden with goods, woolen cloth, cunning jewelry, and fine steel blades. But what caught the beggar's attention was the sight of meat above the fire, steaming and dripping fat onto the coals. He almost fainted at the sweet smell of it for he had been walking all day with nothing to eat but a handful of acorns and a bruised apple he'd found by the side of the road. Stepping into the clearing, the old beggar called out to the three dark-bearded men who sat around the fire. Hello, he said. Can you spare a bit of meat and a piece of your fire? They turned, their gold chains glittering in the firelight. Certainly, their leader said. What do you have with you? Bits or pennies? Rings or strelaum? Or do you have the true ringing sealedish coin we prize above all others? I have none of these, the old beggar said, opening his hands to show they were empty. Then you will find no comfort here, they said, and as he watched, they began to carve thick pieces from the haunch that hung by the fire. No offense, Willem, it's just how the story goes. I didn't say anything. You looked like you were going to. I may, but it will wait till after. The old man walked on, following the light of another fire through the trees. Hello, the old beggar called out as he stepped into the second clearing. He tried to sound cheerful, though he was weary and sore. Can you spare a bit of meat and a piece of your fire? There were four travelers there, two men and two women. At the sound of his voice, they rose to their feet, but none of them spoke. The old man waited politely, trying to appear pleasant and harmless. But the quiet stretched on, long as long, and still no word was spoken. Understandably, the old man grew irritated. He was used to being shunned or shrugged aside, but these folk merely stood. They were quiet and restless moving from foot to foot while their hands twitched nervously. Just as he was about to sulk away, the fire flared and the beggar saw the four, ro saw the four wore the blood-red clothes that marked them as Adem mercenaries. Then the old man understood. The Adem are called the silent folk, and they speak only rarely. The old man knew many stories of the Adem. He'd heard that they possessed a secret craft called the Lathani, this, led them, this let them wear their quiet like an armor that would turn a blade or stop an arrow in the air. This is why they seldom spoke. They, served their, they saved their worlds, keeping them inside like coals in the belly of a furnace. Those hoarded words filled them with so much restless energy that they could never be completely still, which is why they were always twitching and fidgeting about. Then when they fought, they used their secret craft to burn those words like fuel inside themselves. This made them strong as bears and fast as snakes. When the beggar first heard these rumors, he thought them silly campfire stories. But years ago in Modic, he had seen an Adem woman fight the city guard. The soldiers were armed and armored, thick of arm and chest. They had demanded to see the woman's sword in the king's name, and, thought, and though hesitant, she presented it to them. As soon as they held it in their hands, they had leered and pawed at her, making lewd suggestions about what she could do to get it back. They were tall men with bright armor, and their swords were sharp. They fell like autumn wheat before her. She killed three of them, breaking their bones with her hands. Her own wounds were minor by comparison, a dark bruise along one cheek, a slight limp, a shallow cut across one hand. Even after all the long years, the old man remembered the way she had licked the blood from the back of her hand like a cat. This is what the old beggar thought, thought of when he saw the Adem standing there. All thought of food and fire left him and he backed slowly into the shelter of the surrounding trees. Then he set off toward the next fire, hoping the third time would prove lucky. At this clearing were a number of Aturans standing around a dead donkey 
<clears throat> lying near a cart. One of them spotted the old man. Look, he pointed. Grab him. We'll hitch him to the cart and make him pull. The old man darted back into the trees, and after running to and fro, he lost the Aturans by hiding under a pile of moldering leaves. <laughs> when the sound of the Aturans faded, the old man dragged himself from the leaves and found his walking stick. Then, with the courage of one who is poor and hungry, he set off to the fourth fire he saw in the distance. There he might have found what he was looking for, because around the fire were traders from Vintus. Had things been different, they might have welcomed him to dinner, saying, Where six can eat, seven can eat. But by this point the old man was quite a sight. His hair stuck from his head in, a wild dis in wild disarray. His robe, ragged before, was now torn and dirty. His face was pale from fright, and his breathing groaned and wheezed in his chest. Because of this, the Vints gasped and made gestures before their faces. They thought he was a... They thought he was a barrow drog, you see, one of the, the unquiet dead that superstitious Vince believe walked the night. Each of the Vince had a different thought as to sh how they could stop him. Some thought fire would frighten him off. Some thought salt scattered on the grass would keep him away. Some thought iron would cut the strings that held the soul to his dead body. Listening to them argue, the old beggar realized that no matter what they agreed on, he would not be the better for it. So he hurried back to the sheltering trees. The old man found a rock to sit on and brushed the dead leaves and dirt away as best he could. After sitting for a while, he thought to try one final campsite, knowing it would only take one generous traveler to fill his belly. <laughs> he was pleased... <laughs> I'm glad the, the book isn't predictable. He was pleased to see a lone man sitting at the final fire. Coming closer, he saw a thing that left him both delighted and afraid. For, all, for though the beggar had lived many years, he had never before spoken to one of the emir. Still, he knew the emir were a part of Telu's church, and... They weren't part of the church, Willem said. What? Of course they were. No, they were... They were of the Auturan bureau... Oh my god, I can't read. Sorry. No, they were of the Auturan bureaucracy. They had... Vicarum, judiciary powers. They were called the Holy Order of Emir. They were the strong right hand of the church. Bet a jot? Fine, if it will keep you quiet through the rest of the story... The old beggar was delighted, for he knew the emir were a part of Telu's church, and the church was sometimes generous to the poor. The emir came to his feet as the old man approached. "'Who goes there?' he asked. His voice was proud and powerful, but also tired. "'No, I am of the order emir. None should come between me and my tasks. I will act for the good of all, though gods and men might bar my way.' "'Sir,' the beggar said, "'I'm just hoping for a piece of fire and some charity on a long road.' The emir gestured the old man forward. He was armored in a suit of bright steel rings, and his sword was tall as, as a man. His tabard was of shining white, but from the elbows the color darkened into crimson, as if dipped in blood. In the center of his chest he wore the symbol of the emir, the black tower wrapped in a crimson flame. The old man sat near the fire and gave a sigh as the heat soaked into his bones. After a moment the emir spoke. I'm afraid I can offer you nothing to eat. My horse eats better than I do tonight but that does not mean that he eats well. Anything would be a lovely help, the old man said. Scraps are more than what I have. I am not proud. The emir sighed. Tomorrow I must ride fifty miles to stop a trial. If I fail or falter, an innocent woman will die. This is all I have. The emir gestured to a piece of cloth with a crust of bread and a sliver of cheese. Both of them together would hardly be enough to dent the old man's hunger. It made a poor dinner for a man as large as the emir. Tomorrow I must ride and fight, the armored man said. I need my strength, so I must weigh your night of hunger against this woman's life. As he spoke, the emir raised his hands and held them palms up like the plates of a balancing scale. When he made this motion, the old beggar saw the backs of the emir's hands, and for a second he thought the emir had cut himself, and that blood was running between his fingers and down his arms. Then the fire shifted, and the beggar saw it was only a tattoo, though he still shivered at the bloody, at the bloody markings on the emir's hands and arms. He would have done more than shiver had he known all the those markings meant. They showed the emir was trusted so completely by the order that his actions would never be questioned. And as the order stood be behind him, no church, no court, no king could move against him, for he was one of the Siridae, highest of the emir. If he killed an unarmed man, it was not murder in the order's eyes. If he strangled a pregnant woman in the middle of the street, none would speak against him. Should he burn a church or break an old stone bridge, the empire held him blameless, trusting all he did was in the service of the greater good. But the beggar knew none of this, and so he tried again. 
If you don't have any food to spare, could I have a penny or two? He thought of the sealedish camp and how he might buy a slice of meat or bread. The emir shook his head. If I did, I would gladly give it. But three days ago I gave the last of my money to a new widower with a hungry child. I have been penniless, as you are, ever since. He shook his head, his expression weary and full of regret. I wish circumstances were different. But I now must sleep, so you must go. The old man was hardly happy about this, but there was something in the emir's voice that made him wary, so he creaked back onto his feet and left the fire behind. Before the warmth of the emir's fire could leave him, the old man tightened his belt and made up his mind to simply walk through till morning, hoping the end of his road might bring him better luck, or at least a meeting with some kinder folk. So he walked through the center of Farinil, and as he did, he saw a circle of great gray stones. Inside that circle was the faint glow of firelight hidden in a well-dug pit. The old man noticed he couldn't smell a wisp of smoke either, and realized these folk were burning rental wood, which burns hot and hard, but doesn't smoke or stink. Then the old man saw that two of the great shapes were not stones at all, they were wagons. A handful of people huddled round a cook pot in the dim light of the fire. But the old man didn't have a shred of hope left, so he kept walking. He was almost past the stones when a voice called out, "'Ho there! Who are you, and why do you pass by so quietly at night?' "'I'm nobody,' the old man said. "'Just an old beggar, following my road until its end. "'Why are you out walking instead of settling down to sleep? "'These roads are not at all safe at night.' "'These roads are not all safe at night,' the voice replied. "'I have no bed,' the old man said. "'And tonight I cannot beg or borrow one for all the world. "'There is one here for you, There is one here for you, if you would like it, "'and a bit of dinner if you have a mind to share. "'No one should walk all day and night besides.' A handsome, bearded man stepped from the concealment of the tall gray stones. He took the old man's elbow and led him toward the fire, calling ahead, "'We have a guest tonight!' There was a small stir of motion ahead of them, but the night was moonless, and their fire was deep in a concealing pit, so the beggar couldn't see much of what was being done. Curious, he asked, "'Why do you hide your fire?' His host sighed. "'Not all folk are filled with love for us. We're safest by being out of harm's way. Besides, our fire is small tonight.' "'Why is that?' the beggar asked. "'With so many trees, wood should be easy to come by.' "'We went gathering earlier,' the bearded man explained. "'But folk called us thieves and shot arrows at us.' "'He shrugged. "'So we make do, and tomorrow will take care of itself.' "'He shook his head. "'But I am talking too much. "'May I offer you a drink, father? "'A bit of water, if you can spare it. "'Nonsense. You will have wine.' "'It had been a long time since the beggar had tasted wine, "'and he thought of, and the thought of it was enough to set his mouth all the watering but he knew wine was not the best thing for an empty stomach that had walked all day, so he said, You are kind, bless you, but water is good enough for me. The man at his elbow smiled. Then have water and wine, each to your desire. And saying so, he brought the beggar to their water barrel. The old beggar bent and drew up a ladle of water. When it touched his lips, he, it was cool and sweet, but as he drew up the ladle, he couldn't help but notice the barrel was very nearly empty. In spite of this, his host urged him, Take another and wash the dust from your hands and face. I can tell you've been on the road for a long and weary while. So the old beggar took a second dipper of water, and once his hands and face were clean, he felt much refreshed. Then his host took his elbow again and led him to the fire. What is your name, father? Again the beggar was surprised. It had been years since anyone had cared enough to ask his name. It had been so long he had to stop and think about it for a moment. Oh, for God's sake. Scup, he said at last. I am called Scap. And you? It's S-C-E-O-P. I don't know. My name is Terrace, his host said as he made the old man comfortable close to the fire. This is Scylla, my wife, and Wint, our son. This is Shari and Bentham and Lil and Peter and Fent. One of these names is not like the other. Others. Then Terrace brought Scup wine. Scylla gave him a heavy ladle of potato soup, a slice of warm bread, and half a golden summer squash with sweet butter in the bowl of it. It was plain, and there was not a lot, but to Skep it seemed a feast. And as he ate, Wint kept his cup full of wine and smiled at him and sat by his knee and called him grandfather. The last was too much for the old beggar, and he began to cry softly. Perhaps it was that he was old, and his day had been a long one. Perhaps it was that he was not used to kindness. Perhaps it was the wine. Whatever the reason, tears began to trickle down his face and lose themselves in his deep white beard. Terrace saw this and was quick to ask, "'Father, whatever is the matter?' That's, yeah, that's, that was, <laughs> that was, that's why I said what I said. One of these names is not like the other. One of them is just a normal name. Sorry, not normal, that's, uh, 
that's not nice, but you know, but you know what I mean. Um, I am a silly old man, Skep said, more to himself than the rest of them. You have been kinder to me than anyone in years, and I am sorry I cannot repay you. Terrace smiled and laid a hand on the old man's back. Would you really like to pay? I cannot. I have nothing to give you. Ter Terrace's smile widened. Skep, we are the Edimaru. The thing we value most is something everyone possesses. One by one, Skep saw the faces around the fire look up at him expectantly. Terrace said, You could tell us your story. Not knowing what else to do, Skep began to speak. He, he, he told how he had come to fair at Farineal. Oh, these words are killing me. How he had walked from one fire to the next, hoping for charity. At first his voice faltered and his story stumbled, for he had been alone a long time and was not used to talking. But soon his voice became stronger, his words bolder, and as the fire flickered and reflected in his bright blue eyes, his hands danced along with his old dried voice. Even the Edima Ru, who knew who know all the stories in the world, could do nothing but listen in wonder. When his story came to an end, the troopers stirred as if walking, waking from a deep sleep. For a moment they did nothing but look at each other. Then they looked at Skep. <laughs> Sorry. Terrace knew what they were thinking. Skep, he asked gently, where were you headed when I stopped you tonight? I was going to Tenu, said Skep, Skep, who was a little embarrassed at how caught up in the story he had become. His face was hot and red, and he felt foolish. We are bound for Bellinay ourselves, Terrace said. Would you consider coming with us instead? For a moment, Skep's face lit with hope, but then it fell. I would be nothing but a burden. Even a beggar has his pride. Terrace laughed. You would tell the Edema about pride? We do not ask you out of pity. We ask because you belong in our family, and we would have you tell us a dozen, and we would have you tell us a dozen dozen stories of the years to come. In the years to come, the beggar shook his head. My blood is not yours. I am not a part of your family. What does that have to do with the price of butter? Terrace asked. We Rua decide who is a part of our family and who is not. You belong with us. Look around and see if I am lying. Skip looked up at the circle of faces and saw what Terrace said was true. And so the old man stayed, and lived with them for many years before they parted ways. Many things he saw, and many stories he told, and everyone was wiser in the end because of it. This thing happened, though it was years and miles away. I have heard it from the mouths of the Ide Marua, and thus I know it to be true. Chapter 38. Kernels of Truth. Is that the end? Simon asked after a polite pause. He was on his back, looking up at the stars. Yes. It didn't end the way I thought it would, he said. What did you expect? I was waiting to find out who the beggar really was. I thought as soon as someone was nice to him, he would turn out to be to Borlin the Great. Then he would give them the, his walking stick and a sack of money and, I don't know, make something magical happen. He's trying to eat my bracelet. Willem spoke up. He'd say, whenever you are in danger, knock this stick on the ground and say, stick be quick, and then the stick would whirl around and defend them from whoever was attacking them. Willem was lying on his back in the tall grass, too. I didn't think he was really an old beggar. Old beggars in stories are never really old beggars, Simmons said with a hint of accusation in his voice. They're always a witch or a prince or an angel or something. In real life, old beggars are almost always old beggars, I pointed out. But I know what kind of story you two are thinking about. Those are stories we tell other people to entertain them. This story is different. It's one we tell each other. Why tell a story if it's not entertaining? To help us remember. To teach us. I made a vague gesture. Things. Like exaggerated stereotypes? Simon asked. What do you mean by that? I asked, nettled. Tie him to the wagon and make him pull? Simon made a disgusted noise. I'd be offended if I didn't know you. If I didn't know you, I said hotly, I'd be offended. Do you know Aturans used to kill people if they found them living on the road? One of your emperors declared them to be detrimental to the empire. Most were little more than beggars who had lost their homes because of the wars and taxes. Most were simply press-ganged into military service. I tugged at the front of my shirt. But the edema were especially prized. They hunted us like foxes. For a hundred years, Ruhunt was a favorite pastime among the Aturan upper crust. A profound silence fell. My throat hurt, and I realized I'd been shouting. Simmons' voice was muffled. I didn't know that. 
I kicked myself mentally inside. I'm sorry, Simon. It's a... It was a long time ago. And it's not your fault. It's an old story. It would have to be to have a reference to the Emir, Willem said, obviously trying to change the subject. They disbanded, what, 300 years ago? Still, I said, there's some truth in most stereotypes, a seed they sprouted from. Basil is from Ventus, Will said, and he is odd about certain things. Sleeps with a penny underneath his pillow, that sort of thing. On my way to the university, I traveled with a pair of Adem mercenaries, Simmons said. They didn't talk to anyone except each other, and they were restless and fidgety. Willem spoke hesitantly. I will admit to knowing many seal them who take great care to line their boots with silver. Purses, Simmons corrected him. Boots are for putting your feet in. He wiggled a foot to illustrate. I know what a boot is, Willem said crossly. I speak this vulgar language better than you do. Boot is what we say. Patu. Money in your purse is for spending. Money you plan to keep is in your boot. Oh, Simmons said thoughtfully. I see. Like saving it for a rainy day, I guess. What do you do with money when it rains? Willem asked, genuinely puzzled. And there's more to the story than you think, I interjected quickly before things digressed any further. The story holds a kernel of truth. If you promise to keep it to yourselves, a uh, kernel of truth, I will tell you a secret. I felt their attention sharpen onto me. If you ever accept the hospitality of a traveling troop and they offer you wine before anything else, they are a Dimaru. That part of the story is true. I held up a finger to caution them. But don't take the wine. But I like wine, Simmons said piteously. That doesn't matter, I said. Your host offers you wine, but you insist on water. It might even turn into a competition of sorts, the host offering more and more grandly, the guest refusing more and more politely. When you do this, they will know you are a friend of the edema, that you know our ways. They will treat you like family for the night, as opposed to being a mere guest. The conversation lulled as they absorbed this piece of information. I looked up at the stars, tracing the familiar constellations in my head. You and the hunter, the crucible, the young again mother, the fire-tongued fox, the broken tower. Where would you go if you could go anywhere? Simmons' question came out of the blue. Across the river, I said. Bed? No, no, he protested. I mean if you could go anywhere in the world. Same answer, I said. I've been a lot of places. This is where I've always wanted to go. But not forever, Willem said. You don't want to be here forever, do you? That's what I meant, Simon added. We all want to be here, but none of us want to be here forever. Except Manit, Will said. Where would you go? Simon pursued his point doggedly. For adventure. I thought for a moment, quietly. I guess I'd go to the Talonwald, I said. Among the tall? Willem asked. They're a primitive nomadic people, from what I've heard. Technically speaking, the Edema Rua are a nomadic people, I said dryly. I heard a story once that said the leaders of their tribes aren't great warriors. They're singers. Their songs can heal the sick and make tr the trees dance. I shrugged. I'd go there and find out if it was true. I would go to the feigned court, Willem said. Simon laughed. You can't pick that. Why not? Willem said with a quick anger. If Quoth can go to a singing tree, I can go to Fan and dance with Embrula, with Fan women. The tall is real, Simon protested. Fairy stories are for drunks, half-wits, and children. Where would you go? I asked Simon to keep him from antagonizing Willem. There was a long pause. I don't know, he said, his voice oddly empty of any inflection. I haven't been anywhere, really. I only came to the university because after my brothers inherit and my sister... After my brothers inherit and my sister gets her dowry, there isn't going to be much for me except the family name. You didn't want to come here? I asked, disbelief coloring my voice. Sim made a noncommittal shrug, and I was about to ask him something else when I was interrupted by the sound of Willem getting no noisily to his feet. Are we feeling up to the bridge now? My head felt remarkably clear. I got to my feet with only a slight wobble. Fine by me. Just a second, Simmons started to undo his pants as he moved toward the trees. As soon as he was out of sight, Willem leaned close to me. Don't ask about his family, he said quietly. It is not easy for him to speak about. Worse when he is drunk. What? He made a sharp motion with his hand, shaking his head. Later. Simmons bumbled back into the clearing, and the three of us made our silent way back to the road then over Stonebridge and into the university. Let me see. I'll do one more, because this is kind of short. Chapter 39, Contradictions. Late next morning, 
Will and I made our way to the archives to meet up with Sim and settle our bets of the night before. The problem is his father, Willem explained in low tones as we made our way between the grey buildings. Sim's father holds a duchy in Artur. Good land, but... Hold on, I interrupted. Our little Sim's father is a duke? Little Sim, Willem said dryly, is three years older than you and two inches taller. Which duchy? duchy I asked. And he's not that much taller. Delanir, Willem said. But you know how it is. Noble blood from Artur. Small wonder he does not speak of it. Oh, come on, I chided, gesturing to the students filling the street around us. The university has the most open-minded atmosphere since the church burned Caliptena to the ground. I notice you do not make any loud announcement that you're a Dimaru. I bristled. Are you implying I'm embarrassed? I am saying you make no loud announcement, Will said calmly, giving me a steady look. Neither does Simon. I imagine you both have your reasons. Pushing down my irritation, I nodded. Willem continued. Dalinir is in the north of Autorn. Autorn so they are reasonably well off. But he has three older brothers and two sisters. First son inherits. The father bought the second... Uh, the father bought the second a military commission. The third was placed in the church. Simon, Willem trailed off suggestively. I have a hard time imagining Sim as a priest, I admitted, or a soldier, come to think of it. And so Sim ends up at the university, Willem finished. His father was hoping he would become a diplomat. Then Sim discovered he liked alchemy and poetry and entered the Arcanum. His father was not entirely pleased. Willem gave me a significant look, and I gathered he was drastically understating the case. "'Being an Arcanist is a remarkable thing,' I protested. "'Much more impressive than being a perfumed toady in some court.' Willem shrugged. "'His tuition is paid. His allowance continues.' He paused to wave at someone on the other side of the courtyard. "'But Simon does not go home. Not for even a brief visit.' Sim's father likes to hunt, fight, drink, and wench. I suspect our gentle, bookish Sim was probably not given the love of a clever son deserves. Will and I met up with Sim in our usual reading hole and clarified the details of our drunken wagers. Then we went our separate ways. An hour later, I returned with a modest armload of books. My search had been made considerably easier by the fact that I had been researching the Amir since Nina had arrived and given me her scroll. I knocked softly on the door of the reading hole, then let myself in. Will and Sim were already sitting at the table. "'Me first, Simmons said happily. He consulted a list, then pulled a book from his stack. "'Page 152.' He leafed through until he found the page and then began to scan it. "'Aha!' The girl then gave an account of everything, blah, 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 and led them to the place where she stumbled onto the pagan frolic. He looked up, pointing at the page. "'See? It says pagan, right there.' I sat down. "'Let's see the rest.' Simmons, don't do that.' Sim's second book was more of the same, but the third held something of a surprise. A large preponderance of marker stones in the vicinity, suggesting this area might have been crossed with trade routes and some forgotten past. He trailed off, then shrugged and handed the book to me. This one seems to be on your side. I couldn't help but laugh. Didn't you read these before you brought them here? In an hour? He gave a laugh of his own. Not likely. I just used a scriv. Willem gave him a dark look. No, you didn't. You asked Puppet, didn't you? Simon assumed an innocent expression, which on his naturally innocent face only served to make him look profoundly guilty. I might have stopped in to see him, he hedged, and he might have happened to suggest a couple books that had information about grey stones. Seeing Willem's expression, he raised a hand. Don't get sniffy on me. It's backfired anyway. Puppet again, I grumbled. Are you ever going to introduce me? The two of you are so tight-lipped about him. Willem shrugged. You will understand when you meet him. Leave my bracelet alone. Sim's books divided into three categories. One supported his side, telling of pagan rites and animal sacrifices. The other speculated about an ancient civilization that used them as marker stones for roads, despite the fact that some were located on sheer mountainsides or river bottoms where no road could be. His final book was interesting for other reasons. A pair of matched stone monoliths with a third across the top, Simon read. The locals refer to it as the doorpost. While spring and summer pageants involve decorating and dancing around the stone, parents forbid their children from from spending time near it when the moon is full. One well-respected and otherwise reasonable old man claimed... Sim broke off reading. Whatever, he said disgustedly and moved to close the book. Claimed what? Willem asked, his curiosity piqued. Simon rolled his eyes and continued reading. 
claimed at certain times men could pass through the stone door into the fair land where Felurian herself abides, loving and destroying men with her embrace. Interesting, Willem mur murmured. No, it isn't. It's childish, superstitious bunk, Simmons said testily. And none of this is getting us any closer to deciding who is right. How do you count them, Willem? I asked. You're our impartial judge. Willem moved to the table and looked through the books. His dark eyebrows moved up and down as he considered. Seven for Simmon, six for Quoth, three contrary. We looked briefly at the four books I had brought. Willem ruled one of them out, which brought the tally to seven for Simmon and nine for me. Hardly conclusive, Willem mused. Oh, that's, that was a, not the right tone. Hardly conclusive, Willem mused. We could declare it a draw, I suggested mag magnanimously. Simmons scowled. Good-natured or not, he hated losing a bet. Fair enough, he said. I turned to Willem and gave a significant look at the pair of books still untouched on the table. It looks like our bet will be settled a little more quickly, Nia. Willem gave a pr predatory grin. Very quickly, he lifted a book. Here I have a copy of the proclamation which disbanded the emir. He opened to a marked page and began to read. Their actions will henceforth be held in account by the laws of the empire. No member of the order shall presume to take upon themselves the right to hear a case, nor to pass judgment in court. He looked up smugly. See, if they had their adju adjudicating powers revoked, then they must have had some to begin with. So it stands to reason they were a part of the auteur and bureauc bureaucracy. Actually, I said apologetically, the church has always had oh my God, judiciary powers in auteur. I held up one of my two books. It's funny you should bring the Alpura Pro Prolicia, Emir. I brought it, too. The decree itself was issued by the church. William's expression darkened. No, it wasn't. It was listed in here as Emperor Nalto's 63rd decree. Puzzled, we compared our two books and found them directly contradictory. Well, I guess those cancel each other out, Sim said. What else have you guys got? This is Feltemi Rice, the lights of history, Willem grumbled. It's, it is definitive. I didn't think I would need any further proof. Doesn't this bother either of you? I thumped the two contradictory books with a knuckle. These shouldn't be saying different things. We just read twenty books saying different things, Simon pointed out. Why would I have a problem with two more? The purpose of the Greystones is speculative. There is bound to be a variety of options, of opinions. But the Alpura Pro but the Alpura Prolicia Amir was an open decree. It turned thousands of the most powerful men and women in the Aturan Empire into outlaws. It was one of the primary reasons for the collapse of the empire. There's no reason for conflicting information. The order has been disbanded for over 300 years, Simmons said. Plenty of time for some contradictions to arise. I shook my head, flipping through, the, through both of the books. Contrary opinions are one thing. Contrary facts are another. I held up my book. This is the fall of the empire. This is the fall of empire by Gregor the Lesser. He's a windbag and a bigot, but he's the best historian of his age. I held up Willem's book. Feltemi Rice isn't nearly the historian, but he's twice the scholar Gregor was, and scrupulous about his facts. I looked back and forth between the books, frowning. This doesn't make any sense. So what now? Sim said. Another draw? That's disappointing. We need someone to judge. Willem said. A higher authority. "'Higher than Feltemi Rice?' I asked. "'I doubt Lauren can be bothered to settle our bet.' "'Will shook his head, then t stood and brushed the wrinkles from the front of his shirt. "'It means you finally get to meet Puppet.' "'All right. "'That was the end of that chapter, and I'm just going to go ahead and start, stop there. "'And the next chapter is going to be all about this Puppet person, "'so seems like a good spot to look forward to for next time. "'And, um... Yeah, we'll decide what day, and then hopefully Stephen will get caught up in time for the next one. And I'll talk to you guys later. Have a good night.